Welcome, everybody, to the 39th edition of Petja Kutja Night Eindhoven. Temporary Art Center Eindhoven, Studium Generale Brut, and myself would like to welcome you for a full night, full night, no, just one hour of inspiration. We have six exciting speakers today, um, and you will have the opportunity to listen to them, but also ask a question. How? By sending your question in a comment, we will pick one for every speaker, and who knows, your question may be up. Our first speaker of the night was born and raised in a place called Vught, a small town just south of Den Bosch, which is not exactly known as an exciting city. It has a castle or two, a fortress, and is most well known for its German concentration camp and a psychiatric center. It does have a genie museum. Now, before you think that's where you can grant your three wishes, no, it's dedicated to the Army Corps of Engineers. No wonder our next guest had to get out of town to seek culture and new things. And he started doing this at a very early age, taking his camera in search of anything that would pique his curiosity. A quest that has not ended to this day. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention for Dan Ribbon. Hello. So, hello. My name is Dan Weber and uh, I'm an Eindhoven-based photographer and designer. And today I'm going to talk about my photography. Um, I, everything surrounding us is design, but nothing lasts forever. Um, so think about your vacuum cleaner or the bus stop. Uh, everything is designed, but we see these design mostly as a normality. So I uh, use photography to investigate this subject. And with photography, I try to, uh, to, in, to search for the boundaries of this medium to, of imagery. And I mostly focus on one specific object to keep it uh, very easy and to actually understand uh, a topic. Uh, so this is my nephew, uh, Sam. He's a cool kid and uh, he has a toy gun. Um, and one day I was sitting in my... Uh, uh, I'm at, at, on the couch with my parents and Sam was holding me at gunpoint with this gun. And I found that kind of strange. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is a normal design. We, I, I, I know this from my childhood. Is this actually still normal or is this something we can change? So I was looking into the uh, world of toy guns and I found uh, the whole market of strange shaped laser weapons and neon neon colored water pistols and um, some were very fun but others were maybe a bit too real and i investigated this aesthetical part and the lawful part of this subject and i found this guideline book from the uh, uh, book guideline file from the eu and it says that some that you need uh, uh, CE mark to call it a toy gun and uh, to have the CE mark you need uh, um, you, you need a gun a toy a toy that no kid can suffocate in in these little pieces or the plastic is uh, well made it's uh, and uh, but it doesn't say anything about ethics or that uh, an object can look too real or um, that is maybe not ethical to let children play with it. So actually, all these companies in China can design anything uh, and put it on the market in um, in the EU. And I found that very strange. And I talked with this weapon expert, Jas van Driel, about this, uh, about this 100 uh, photographs that I made of uh, toy guns. And uh, he also said that this is not uh, a rule uh, that is anywhere written. So uh, there's total freedom in how we design these objects. So at the end of this uh, of these 100 EU approved guns, I made uh, a book called Peacekeepers. 
And this book goes from, um, from is arranged with this weapon expert and me as a, just a civilian from really fake to kind of real. So um, with this book, I tried to uh, have a, create a conversation piece for people to talk about where do I draw the line? Where do I think this object is becoming too real? And where would I let my kid play with? Um, so I think this, um, this uh, book only containing imagery also gives the possibility to, uh, to talk about it instead of giving them already an answer. Um, therefore, it's, there's not much text in it, but it says it mostly talks about uh, how what we uh, are scared for in our daily life we look uh, for in fiction and fantasy. So therefore, I also hope this is an opportunity to talk about the bigger uh, um, uh, craving for, uh, for uh, violence in our daily life, because still the most popular Netflix series are the ones with serial killers or uh, with a lot of violence in it. So here we, you see on this, uh, this photograph is uh, already almost the end of the book. Uh, this is actually the last page. Um, and this is also, this gun is made by Heckler & Koch, that's also a gun uh, factory that make real guns. So <laughs> it's a real replica of a gun, and this also carries the uh, CE brand. Um, so um, the question is, do we actually want uh, our next generation to play with these kind of toys, or do we want to stop with this? So I also try to not have a too too critical point of view on this topic because I really want just to show with photography as an aesthetical research to show what's out there and for people to form an opinion about it because also everybody has a different opinion about it. Uh, some use it, say that I they, they give it to their kids for educational reasons or just to make their kid happy, <laughs> their grandkid happy. And also on the back, you see kind of the reviews that people give on these toy guns. So this is more the middle of the book that where you know, uh, where you can find the, yeah, the classical Nerf guns that you see nowadays a lot. But you also have a, also a part in the book where you find more Western guns that we might know. The cap gun. Um, and it's, it's the demand that keep, keeps this business alive because if nobody buys it, it will at the end vanish. And because the EU doesn't give uh, proper measurements for it, for the ethics, we must um, be conscious about our choice of toys to, um, to actually make, <laughs> yeah, make uh, our kids grow up and be educated in the well, right way. And we might not uh, let kids be uh, have this violent objects be uh, connected with entertainment. So this is also you see the bookmark. This is where I draw the line, and you can place this in in, uh, in at a place in the book. And you can buy the book at www.david.com or follow me through Instagram to stay updated. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Dan. Um, well, wonderful story. I'm interested to see the entire book. And there's one question that, that pops in my mind is where do you draw the line? Um, I, I draw the line somewhere in the middle. Because uh, um, I, I find it, I, I find them um, kind of also, there's a kind of a beautiful uh, side uh, of this uh, topic because they are, they are designed by some someone in in <laughs> in China, and he put a lot of effort in it. And so they are also kind of aesthetical objects. And I and I when I find them um, not having any connection uh, with a real gun, so not by by color, not by uh, shape or ornaments, I find it okay. Okay. And there's a question from the audience. We don't have a name with it, but uh, the question is, as a kid, did you have toy guns? I, I didn't, actually. But I, I made my own <laughs> with PVC uh, <laughs> tubes. Ah, yes, I remember those, and sh shooting white berries. So, so, so I also think, for me, it was not that 
uh, for me, I, I found in my research also that this gun is not always representing a gun, but also a, a way of investigating. So through your gun, you're actually investigating your surroundings. And that, I think that's a kind of a very beautiful way of uh, playing. But some things are not to play with. And uh, that, that this is, in the end of the book, you can see what is, what I'm actually talking about, that some guns go to, to get too realistic and you can, you, you can put your qu questions uh, behind that object. Okay. Any ideas on how this gun thing, as a, as a kid, it relates to our nature of hunting, I guess, some, somehow. It's... What makes a gun so attractive to to us and to kids especially? Do you have any ideas yeah, so, on that? So, so what 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 uh, what the books talk about? To, what the book talks about is that we what we are mo mo most scared of is what we're craving for to actually uh, prepare us for our daily life to uh, get uh, in contact with this violence, because always. We 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 get attracted to the most um, uh, to the most things that to the things that we most scared of, and I think that therefore kids want to play with this kind of objects. Okay, well, thank you, Dan, for your wonderful work. Um, if you're interested, go check out his website, buy his book, support his work. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, our next speaker, as the director of the Temporary Art Center, she's been one of the driving forces behind Pecha Kucha Eindhoven for the last couple of years. Um, personally, I think she deserves a lot of credit for revamping Temporary Art Center into a very lively, bustling place with fantastic exhibitions and highlighting scores of young and talented artists. I know she and her team are ready for the next big challenge they are facing, and they will bring it to a success. Please, may I have your attention for Astrid Riona Katz. Thank you for a great introduction. Um, start. So, Luke mentioned already that you might know Tak from Pecha Kuchas. But for the people who don't know Tak from Pecha Kucha or haven't attended Tak uh, before Corona crisis hit our world, um, Tak is a cultural incubator in the city center of Eindhoven. And you can be a cultural incubator in many, many ways. But for us, it means that we try to stimulate art and artists in as many ways as we can. And we particularly try to do this by making connections between what's happening in our environment. So in our area, in our city, in our neighborhoods, and what's happening within TAC, so the making of art. Um, and that's all very well, it's a very nice, happy story, but actually I'm here today to tell you about the biggest challenge that we face. And it's not really only a happy uh, story, but I hope we can transform it into one. As you can see, our building is not in a great state, so we literally have nature, nature coming into our building. Um, and this is due to the fact that TAC is actually not, uh, it's not owned by us I and mean, we cannot maintain this current building. This building is now owned by the municipality and we are in a position that we get to use it for the cause that we do to stimulate art. But this is, as you can see, like this is huge leakage problems and all sorts of problems that hit our building and we really need to have something done. Um, this is where we are in the inner city area. So as you can see, we are close to the PSV stadium, but we are also in an area that has a lot of vacant spaces. And as our city is growing and a lot of people want to uh, move into our city, this is actually quite weird. And we need in our city to build new houses. So housing is a big issue. Um, but when apartment buildings are going to be built in the area that Tuck is in now, it threatens our existence because what if these buildings are going to be built on our side? Like, where are we going to be? We are not the owners. Um, so in many, many ways, something needs to be done. 
both in a way for us to have our building function in a much better way, but also to make sure that our building still has a place in the future. And that artists and the making of art and the making of design is still happening in, in a city Eindhoven, uh, also in a long-term future. So um, this is our plan. Um, we don't want to counter urban development. I don't believe we can, and I don't think that's something that we should aspire. We want to be part of urban development. And even boldly put, we want to be urban developers. Um, but really, we are not. Like, I'm not a builder. I know not so much about building. I'm doing a little bit about these processes. So we are in a joint venture together with people who do. So we, we are going into a joint venture with a property developer. And together, we team up to both build houses to make money out of this area, but also to sustain TAC. Um, and this is an idea of what it will look like. So on the left, you see a, uh, an image of our current tech building. And on the right, you see an image of the building in the future, the pink area. And the blue buildings are obviously apartment buildings for housing. So as you can see, our building will shrink a lot. It will be much smaller. But I think if we develop this well and if we design it well, then we can make spaces that are better apt for what we're doing. So we can actually accommodate more artists and designers in our building, but also more audiences. And we can organize more events, but also better events with better facilities. So in a way, there's actually a big room for improvement of TAC in this situation. And a lot of people ask me like, so, okay, so when you're building this new ideal TAC, what will you do? But honestly, I really hope that we get to continue doing the things that we're doing now. I think I'm super proud that, that we are able to provide affordable art spaces. So artists who are often not in a really good financial position can still, you know, have a space within the city center. And also that we can do this kind of pop-up, uh, spontaneous, sometimes very much structured, but also sometimes very organic running projects and programs, hence Pecha Kucha. Um, and then, yeah, how will we get there? Um, where are we now? So there's one thing in dreaming up the ideal new duck and to dream up this solution, but I've also come to realize that uh, to actually build this, you get, yeah, well, you, you get stuck to a lot of political, juridical, financial constraints, and um, they're not so easy to solve. So there will, the end, the end talk that will be there, the future talk will be some kind of, I hope not a compromise, but kind of a conclusion of the expertise of all these different people with all these different knowledge um, to make an actual plan for this dream dot, dreamed up talk that we have. So, we need to design talk together. So we need to include the expertise of people who know a lot about finance and about legal stuff and who are architects. And But also we need to have the people who are the artists and the designers and the audiences that we have in talk. So um, that is an exciting but fun challenge. So where we are now is uh, in this whole process is actually that we are going to move away from our current site. Most of the TAC residents are going to go to a school building, uh, the Kronenhoefstraat, and here you see images of it. Um, but this is for most of us, and not all of TAC will, will go there. Uh, in the next few years, when we start the build, we will have to move different uh, disciplines and different uh, uh, elements of TAC to different locations. And I think this is quite challenging because now the strength perhaps of TAC is that there's so many different things happening within the same building, but they will be cut up. Um, so it's one big experiment. And um, I have ideas about how we're going to do, but we will just have to try. We do not know for certain, but I think doing this experiment is who we are. And yes, some things will fall apart, but also some other things will rise and flourish. And I hope if we succeed, or better put, when we succeed, that we can be even more temporary than we are now, and we can have many more events, and we can have many Pecha Kucha events such as these, but then not only online, but also in the real, in our future talk building. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, uh, Astrid. Um, we are getting a question from the audience to who someone under the name of Quiz Try. It's challenging you to give an honest reaction and not a political one. And he says, uh, do you really think your plans were going to be realized in this 
in ever more right-wing political environment? Um, okay, so yes, uh, I'm actually sure because we are, uh, uh, well, all, like we are al almost at the final stage of having the contract with our municipality. Um, and uh, the city council has already voted, I think like a year and a half ago to agree to this plan. So formally, yes. Um, but then um, in all honesty, like the, the question like, are our plans going to be realized? Of course, our plans are quite extensive. They vary from being the, like what I ideally want is that now I say, where is stuck? And I say, it's next to the PSV st stadium. What I want is that people ask, where's the PSV stadium? And everyone says, it's next to Tuck. And if we can realize that plan, like how big our ambitions are, we'll have to see, but we'll fight. All right. It. Big dreams. Well, thank you very much, uh, Astrid. I'm really looking forward to, to the process and see what will happen also in the meantime. Um, I wish you and the team good luck. Thank you. Now, for our regular viewers, you might wonder, you might see a different face, um, or you might think this guy's grown old rapidly. Um, our more frequent viewers, may even recognize me from years ago. The thing is, success always has a turning point or a backside. Um, in this case, our pre previous presenter, Gijs Habraak, is becoming so successful in his work that he has decided to step down as a presenter. We're very sorry for that. And we want to thank Gijs for all his energy, his humor, his jokes, the amazing speakers that he brought into the program and all the work that he's done for Petje Kutje Eindhoven. And we also would like to thank Anneke Kotrotsos from Brut, who is also unfortunately leaving our team to focus on her own work as well. Um, Brut has been involved with Petje Kutje for the last three or four years. She's always been very active in the team. They've given us amazing speakers throughout the years. And we want to thank Brut and Anneke especially for all her efforts. Thank you. Now for all you English or not native Dutch speaking audience, do you know what a pop label is? A pop label. It literally translates porridge spoon and it's used to feed toddlers or babies. Um, and there's a famous Dutch saying that says, being fed something or having something poured in by the pop label. Meaning that you've, there's something that you've been taught or inspired with from a very, very young age. And that is what happens to our next guest. With his mom being a designer, he's been dragged all over the country to exhibitions, to museums, to things like the Dutch Design Week to show him design. And reluctant at first, the bug really caught him onto him as a teen. And there's been no stopping him becoming a designer. Please may I have your attention for Sam van der Horst. Hi, uh, so today I'm gonna to tell you something about participation in urban planning. So in the, the past decades, the participation of citizens is something that has become more important. In recent years, through practices such as co-creation, citizens are being included in the urban planning process. But these ways of inclusion can be quite boring and superficial, with people having to decide, for example, how many trees and garbage bins they would prefer, instead of helping to visualize what their future environment could look like. My name is Sam van der Horst, and I'm an industrial design graduate student at the TUE. Today I will tell you about my design research project called What's Going On, in which I explored new ways of participation in the urban planning process. To my research, to do my research, I went to the Swedish city of uh, to work for RISE, which is the Research Institute of Sweden. Here I worked at the Transforming Societies Group, which is located in this beautiful building called the Pink. Uh, the context of my research was the island of Un. And it is an island that's centrally located in Umeå, and the city has big plans for it. So they want UN to be the new urban area of the city, where it will be an extension of the city's center as a residential, commercial area. 
So this is making Thailand uh, and development of it a crucial project for the future of the city of Umeå. So as a designer, uh, doing research can be quite a chaotic process. So to structure this, I chose to use the methodology of constructive design research. Uh, in short, you can call it CDR. Uh, this type of research is defined as research that imagines and builds new things and describes these constructions. So to start my research, I did several design explorations into what new ways of citizen participation could be for an uh, uh, and these included, for example, an interactive puzzle showing information on the development, uh, a digital tower viewer uh, that would show you how the development would look like at the location, and an abstract visualization of citizens' attitudes uh, towards the development of the uh, So all these explorations together helped me to construct the, the What's Going On experience. So What's Going On is a virtual reality experience that aims to help citizens to imagine what the island could look like in the future. It shows them different perspectives on what the island could be and what other people be believe the island could be. So it facilitates the exchange of perspectives and it opens up the citizens' creativity. So I wanted to make the experience available for a large audience. And traditional VR is not that accessible since you would need a special headset and a powerful computer. So to tackle this, I made this VR experience website-based. So anyone with a smartphone and a phone-compatible VR headset, for example, Google Cardboard, uh, is able to take part in this. Um, so to create the environment of uh, the experience, uh, I needed photographs of the area around that I could in virtual space. So I used a 360 degree take picture stations, uh, one on the city side looking at the island and one on the island side looking at the city. So I used these pictures to make a series of variations to create different reactions. To do so, I traced the images to create abstract drawings that I would later use as a coloring page and I used filters to create negatives and black and white pencil versions of the pictures. I asked the participants to use the coloring page, uh, which is one of the traced images, uh, to create their perspective on the island. Uh, while doing this, I was being careful not to influence them on what to create on this coloring page. Uh, and this resulted in a large series of drawings ranging from abstract lines to cable cars crossing the river to the island, uh, but even a, a sunny beach with palm trees. Uh, and I could all of these I could turn into the virtual space I needed for the experience. So the virtual reality experience itself is a continuous merging of these environments. Uh, and it's made up out of these 360 pictures, the edited versions, the drawings of the participants. And from the outside, it looks perfect. Dull. It's just someone with a head um, and you don't know what they're seeing, but uh, what they're seeing is a whole other world. So uh, this world, different reality merging and they are put inside their own drawings and drawings of others. So now you should be able to see uh, about what they're seeing uh, on both eyes. If it works. I hope. So what there is is um, on different eyes, the, the visuals, uh, sorry, no, the visuals are merging. And what this does when you're uh, ha having a VR headset on is that it actually like your eyes, your brain uh, layers the images together. Uh, it's not working correctly. But your brain layers the images together, so it creates a, a merging of these uh, virtual environments. Um, you're constantly seeing other things. So when I um, fin when they finish this trip, uh, which is but that's what it's really like. Um, I interviewed the participants, and two things uh, emerged from this. So one was that they were more open to the new urban developments of UN, and two was that they expressed that they felt very creatively stimulated to think about these new developments. So um, to round off my research, of for, so uh, I derived three other qualities uh, from these interviews uh, and the analysis of the interviews and these for ambiguity, creative freedom and immersion. And to round off my research, I made a pictorial, which is a a scientific format in which the visual components are the primary means of conveying information. Um, and I had to go to publish my pictorial at the Thai conference. Um, uh, so I sent it in this year and it got accepted. So I got to uh, present my work there this year. 
unfortunately mine. Um, so if you would like to read my pictorial and learn more about what's going on, you can contact me or look on my website. And here you can experience what's going on yourself and see more of my previous projects. Uh, my name is Sam van Horst, and this was my Petje Kutje on what's going on. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Sam, for this uh, intriguing story about your research. Um, thank you. Thank the, you thing I was, the, the thing I was wondering is, um, how do you feel this can be implemented in, in future urban developments? Uh, yeah, what's interesting to see is that it, it's a very contextualized experience. So you really need to first be able to uh, bring uh, the location of a new urban development within this uh, space. You need to translate all of that. So to constantly um, having to do that for a new location would be quite hard, but uh, the three design quality these I found uh, through my, um, it can be really helpful in creating such experiences like this one, uh, where people are actually like included in visualizing or thinking about the future without being um, feeling like they're creatively challenged because not everyone is uh, has the skills to express themselves the same. Okay. And there's a question from Wandering Stardust. Uh, do you think this application will be used on a wider scale in the near future? Um, well, I did some I did uh, some research before um, starting on my uh, uh, making my VR experience, and I found actually that there's like it is used in certain ways, uh, but it's mainly used by. Designers um, of or plans to fit themselves or for like the project leaders and it's not really um, used to include people in the process it's only used to show what's what it's going to be but it's not used to help people think on what it could be okay. uh, so they will only include it in this VR process at the end so nice development for the future uh, thank you Sam for for being here and I wish you all good wish you good luck uh, furthering your process and furthering your career. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Luke. When a master of business management and a spatial designer, designer come together, you might think that they are working on some big office rebuild or a spatial project. And you may think that one will take the role of being focused on budget and planning and the other one want to be the wild creative ideas and they would bash all the time. This next presentation will come to show two things. First of all, you cannot judge a book by its cover. Your title, your education doesn't say anything about who you are or what you do. And it shows what can happen when two people get together and truly connect. Please welcome Ineke Noordhuizen and Eunice van Gemert. Van Gemert. Thank you very Thank much, you. Luke, yes. for this wonderful introduction. So hello, everyone. I am Ineke Noordhuizen, and the other lovely lady you see is Eunice van Gemert. I'm a theater maker, uh, as well as an uh, industrial engineer. Yonis is a special designer, and we're here today to talk about a creative project that we are working on together, which is the Brick Ballet. And the objective is to make bricks dance, and we'd like to share our making process so far. So why bricks? Well, this is me at age six, and as you can see, I was already uh, really interested in bricks from a very early age. Uh, I was really interested in technique, and you can see the little red uh, hood looking at the big truck. Yeah. And this is me as a little girl. This is at uh, one of my dad's uh, expositions. And my mom, she's a, she's a florist, so I've always been involved with art and had a lot of creative things around me. So when I was, I was told I wanted to go to the art academy, uh, nobody was uh, surprised. So, yeah. And this is uh, how we met about a year ago <laughs> at a film set. They needed some extra zombies, and uh, Inigo was one of the main actresses. And we just started talking to each other and figured out that like, we really felt connected uh, already at this point. And 
we thought like, yeah, maybe we can do something together in the future. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how our, uh, our love story began. <laughs> Yes, and yeah. the, the origin story of the Brick Ballet is that I was working at Theatre Lab, working on new scenes for a theatre piece I'm developing, which is called Under Construction. And uh, I found myself using bricks in every scene that I was making. And so somehow the brick fascination never stopped me uh, from age six on. And uh, that's when I woke up one morning and I thought we have to make a really big, nice brick ballet. But I need a special designer to work together with me on this idea. And that's when I called Yonis and we said, OK, let's go get us yeah. some bricks and let's do this. Yeah, hoppa. <laughs> yeah, I was immediately super excited, of course. And uh, so then I started like this aesthetic research. We have here some examples and we really like the idea of the bricks uh, hanging in midair because it's just creates some kind of tension and especially if you involve another person with it, it's yeah, really uh, something we thought was really interesting to start off with. So uh, it was a really nice picture to have. And then we had the question, uh, how are you going to make this dance? How is this going to, uh, to move? So I did some kinetic research and the conclusion from this is was, we need this to be an analog installation because the, we think the connection between the performer or maybe an audience and the installation is so important to, to tell the story. So then I started some form researches and uh, yeah, on see how you can move this on an analog way. And on the right, I thought it was really fun if the frame would be kind of flexible. You can pull it to the ground and then the bricks will be flying all across the, the installation and the room and uh, it really sparks some joy with me. Yeah, and the, what I really liked about all this research is that it really helped us to decide like more on the form. So uh, we chose a frame with dangling bricks from it. And as you can see, we, uh, well, then we're researching. So, okay, what can we do if this is the form we are taking? Um, and what can we do with it theatrically? Yeah, so then uh, there was a point where we started building the scale model. It was really nice to, for the first time to be able to have this actual uh, um, interaction with the, with the little bricks. And here I was kind of playing with uh, different kinds of pulleys, with different sizes. And this way you can uh, move an entire row of bricks in all in one time on different yeah. heights. Yeah. And it really made me super happy to see it for the first time because we had the structure there, we had uh, the, the metal cage there, we had the bricks there, but we still wanted to make it dance. So we, I also started uh, to look into ballet more, about ballet movement and about how we can translate it. And the funny thing was around that time that I was looking at movements and how we can make bricks dance, there were actually people doing that in the city center yeah. uh, during the curfew riots. As you can see, this guy is making a nice dance move, throwing a brick at uh, probably the central station. So all of a sudden, the thing we were working on became really current. Another current thing that's going on in Eindhoven is that they're going to replace all the red bricks in the city center. And well, obviously we are still trying to stalk yeah. uh, the municipality <laughs> to get those bricks uh, for our installation. Because how nice uh, would it be if we can make those bricks, give, a, give them a nice pension uh, in our installation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, further on, it, it's really about Eindhoven, connecting ourselves to Eindhoven and to the uh, ecosystem here. So we also work together with uh, Talk and we work together with uh, Zandbach, which is uh, located uh, near the central station. And uh, yeah, it's a great to work together with so many local um, organizations. Yeah, so this is uh, the second version of the, the model with a lot more bricks, as you can see. And here we were trying to play a little with uh, making images. In this example, the logo of Eindhoven. But we really decided that we want to uh, investigate more in how the abstract uh, way of movement between um, the bricks and the space. And this is also an example. We want to uh, incorporate uh, light and sound as well. And you can really see how it can uh, ele elevate the entire installation and even incorporate the space or the people uh, surrounding it. So that's just kind of where we're at now at this point. Yes, and so we have a lot of uh, technical challenges to face to make this uh, the installation real, but also, of course, the performance dance part. And that's why we uh, included Vitoria Aquino. She's a Brazilian performance artist specialized in performing in the public space. And we uh, want to, in the end, build this installation. Um, and yeah. Exactly, yeah. This, that's the next step for us to bring everything together, the bricks, the frame, the performer, the, the light, the sound, and have an opportunity to 
uh, search uh, for nice images of why, nice ways to uh, connect these. And with the results of this uh, research, we're trying to uh, work towards an actual uh, production. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so are you also feeling this vibe about bricks <laughs> and you want to share your vibe or help us uh, make donations or find sponsoring to make this project a reality? Or if you just like to keep uh, up to date on what we're doing and making, please send us an email to bucksteinballet at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, Janice and Ineke. Wonderful project. I'm uh, curious, when, uh, when do you plan to perform? When do you hope to perform, of course? Yeah, we are hoping that we can still do it this year. Yeah. Uh, um, and we would really love to build it uh, outside if we can uh, at Zandbach and then also uh, have audience. But well, something little going on called Corona. And we, of course, we also need some budget still to make it a reality because the thing's going to be like three and a half meters high, six meters wide and two and a half meters deep. So you can kind of imagine it's not something we just, uh, um, you know, uh, get out of our pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's the challenge we face now. We're yeah, aiming exactly. for uh, September, October this year. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. Uh, we have a, a question from Quiz Try. Uh, he says he likes it a lot that you're usually actual brick, but he was wondering if you're also working on an online edition now that yes. you have to wait yeah. for a long time. Yeah, we've been thinking about it, because eh? we're actually, uh, yeah, we want to do the research first for ourselves in, in real life and then see what the possibilities of the yeah performances are this maybe yeah online as well and uh, yeah, yeah the idea also was that uh, what we really like is also why we share our our uh, progress so far is yeah. that uh, we really believe in in sharing also yeah. the process so not just sharing the end result but including people in the process and in the making itself okay. so we are also planning to during our research phase already make a lot of video and uh, photography material that we can already share with uh, well with the people who are interested in this project yeah. and uh, yeah i'm thinking uh, i think uh, maybe onis we have to think about some more interactive ways to already include people uh, in our research phase. yeah that would interesting be fun. super yeah. interesting yes definitely all right so people um, check them out try to find them on facebook you can probably <laughs> find them through our channel and try to stay up to date go visit their tryouts whatever the shows in september and october yeah, thank you in again yeah thank you Jonas. <laughs> buckstein ballet at gmail.com right yes. great thank you <laughs> all right good luck girls thank, thank, you. You. thank you um for, whew, <laughs> our fifth speaker is a typical kid from the 70s you know the kind of person that has a lot of interests a lot of curiosities and does a lot of things, but whatever he does, he's doing it all the way. I got to know this guy, ooh, I think maybe 10 years ago already. Uh, at that time, he was really into restoring classic cars, the Citroën de Chevaux, to be exact. Restoring them to exact specific qualities, taking them to car shows, being an active figure in the de Chevaux club, someone who is really engaged in everything he does. Last week, he quit his job as a social worker because he now has a new project. And I'm sure he will bring this project to a success. Please welcome Joris van den Beegen. Thank you very much, Luke. And good evening, everybody. Centralized electricity storage and recovery. I would rather have called it the Brabantse Basalt Batterij. But well, it's not my invention, it's my dad's invention. Ever since I was about 18, I was interested in an alternative for fossil fuels and a way to live uh, self-sustainable. This is my essay you see here on the background, which I wrote when I was 18. And the essay on self-sustainability was, for, for, was uh, made, uh, written by a friend of mine. And to combine those two made that some seven years ago, I had the opportunity to buy a farm. A farm between Best and Oorschot, just uh, north of Eindhoven. And I thought, now I'm going to show the world how you should build something 
to be self-sustainable. And what do you need to be self-sustainable? The biggest question is energy. So as you can see here, this is my farm. I bought some solar panels. I bought heat pipes. I bought a big container to accumu accumulate the heat that was produced in these heat pipes. And I was feeling quite proud of myself. You can see here the technical room, which uh, we call the spaghetti room because of all the pipes and wires. And I built a small, uh, I bought a small computer to uh, uh, make it all work and programmed it all together. And then when it was uh, just about finished, my dad came round and he said, well, well what, what, what did you build? I said, I made a self-sustainable heating system and heating storage system. And he says, well, you've done your best, but there is sun and heat in summer. And you need all this heat in winter. Here you can see my father when he was about 18, just when I was at the same age when I wanted to build something with alternative fossil, an alternative to fossil fuels. And he said, but you need the most energy in winter. So you need to build a seasonal storage system. You can see here how much hours of solar power there is in summer and how much heat you will need in winter. And in this particular way of storage, size does matter. Because the amount of energy you store isn't as much interesting as the much energy you lose. And the smaller your system is, or your accumulator is, the bigger your relatively your heat loss is. So he said, what you did is a nice beginning, but I think we should do things differently. He says, what did your system cost? I said, well, somewhere about 30,000. <coughs> He said, well, for that kind of money, I think I can build something that will keep you warm all winter. So he just started to build one. He said, I'm going to build you a machine that will keep you warm all winter. He started by building an insulated foundation. On top of that foundation, he put a shipping container. Why? Well, it was in the neighborhood and didn't cost anything. In that shipping container, he put rocks, in this case, basalt. Along with these rocks, he put in tubes of steel. And this whole container, he packed it in high temperature resistant insulation. We call that rock wool. It doesn't cost anything. And it works everywhere. This was easy to build, quite low tech, and even uh, affordable to build. And when he finished building it, he bought the solar panels. He made a whole wall of solar panels and an uh, inverter. And the inverter sent the energy to his battery at the battery. He bought a gigantic uh, transformer to keep make the, that high voltage of 230 volts back to some 18 volts. And he put that, that electricity through the pipes. And the pipes heat up. And with the pipes heating up, the rocks heat up. And he heat up this whole system to... 100 degrees Celsius, 200 degrees Celsius, 300 degrees Celsius. It was a bit smelly, some fumes here and there. 400 degrees Celsius, and even up to 450 degrees Celsius. And believe it or not, it worked. It heat up in summer, and in winter, he used it to warm the water. And the water is used to warm up the house that stands beside it. And then a newspaper came and the newspaper says, the system works. As you can see here. Then VPRO's tegenlicht came and they said, 
system works. This is low tech. And then the eco village in Bukol, you can see here in the background. They were the first to say we're going to do, we're just going to do this. And we're going to build this one. And they were the first to order our system. I am, I believe, not even believe, I'm convinced that this system will drive our energy transition. So remember, it's the centralized energy storage and recovery system, probably also known as the Brabantse Basalt Batterij. Thank you very much. Good evening. Well, thank you, Joris, for this great explanation uh, and this wonderful system. Uh, I know a lot of uh, groups at TUE, a lot of or, uh, organizations, companies are working on this energy transi transition, trying all kinds of high-tech features, and here your dad comes and simplifies everything to something even I can understand. Um, but I was wondering, what, what kind of scale can this be used? Would this mean like every house would have its own Brabantse Basalt Batterij? Yeah. The first one we're building now is for 36 homes. They are 36 tiny houses in the eco-village in Bukel. Uh, by comparison, when you would use normal scale housing, you'll probably have 25 houses, but this is still a very small system. It actually works the best by let's say 50 uh, homes and up. Okay, and then just for reference, if you would make a system for 50 homes, what? how much would that cost, roughly? Uh, it depends on a few parameters, like uh, where does the system stand? How far is the system from the houses itself? Um, but roughly, uh, we think we can build it for um, 20 to 25,000 euros per home, which means you have no okay. cost for heating for 25 to 30 years. Well, that's, well, that's uh, uh, promising. promising. I'm looking, I'm looking forward, forward to, to, to see your further, further development. development. Please, come Please come to keep, keep us posted. posted. Maybe we'll, Maybe we'll ask, ask you to come, come back, back again, again when you have systems fully, fully functioning, functioning and have, have revolutionized, revolutionized the world of indoor, indoor housing, housing heating. heating. Uh, um, thank you thank very, very much, much for being, for being uh, here. Uh, 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 we'll meet again. again. I will. I will. Thank, thank you very much. Before we go to our last speaker, I would like to thank the audience that is viewing for sticking around, for still being here after one year of lockdown and online Pecha Kucha nights. Um, it, it still feels weird doing this online, I think. Um, and the March edition last year was actually one of the very first events that was cancelled due to Corona. It was, I think, two days before the regional lockdown went into effect, about five days before the national lockdown. We already had to cancel our event. Now imagine that at that time you would have been on a tropical paradise called Karimunjawa, in Indonesia, and it is a lovely place. I know I've been there. Beautiful place, most wonderful fish market, most wonderful seafood you'll ever eat in your life. Imagine being there last year, latently aware of this pending pandemic, just relaxing, having a good time. And then all of a sudden you have to rush back home while all the flights are already fully booked, borders are closing, airports are closing. And that's just what happened to our last speaker. And the funny thing is this whole Corona crisis would become a pivotal item in his growing notoriety, at least here in this city. And also the reason why we invited him to speak here tonight at Pecha Kucha. Please, a warm welcome for our last speaker of the night, David Hordijk. Thank you, thank you. Da, 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 da. These, of course, are the opening notes of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven. I think you have all artists. And for me, music has always been everywhere because these notes have been put on my birth card. I was born the fifth child in a family of five. And my father, he was a teacher. My mother, she was, uh, she was, um, uh, 
that was my phone, but we'll just forget that. <laughs> my father was a preacher man and my mother was a teacher. And you can see, see us all up there in the family portrait. Um, and that little guy, that's me. And I would play at every piano I would come across. So um, this was at my uncle's birthday party. And uh, even there, I would go and play. And uh, all my nieces and nephews, they would be uh, quite amazed because I could play by heart. And you will find out why I could do this uh, in one of our later slides. Um, this is the church that my father was a preacher man at. And this is also where our family, uh, family life took kind of a sad turn because my father actually suffered from a, bur from a burnout here. And um, while I think he's a good preacher man, he was maybe less good a politician. And I think you need both to run a church. So he went to recover from this burnout. And there um, he did all kinds of physical chores, but he had an accident there. He fell from a ladder and he suffered from lasting brain damage. And we're lucky he's still alive because he fractured his neck as well. And when he came back to the dinner table, um, he was just not the same anymore and not able to handle stress anymore. He wasn't when he was uh, suffering from a burnout, but it was even worse after that. So uh, this made for a very few tense years for our family. And I think it was in the same time um, that my mother actually still found time to put me on piano lessons. And this is where I met another one of my uh, pianos, which I loved so much. What you see here is the theater of Helmond, where my mother worked, but it's also um, the center of art. So here I met my really, really beloved piano teacher. And he always, uh, even when I would not practice, he would always have fun with me. And this is the reason, this piano, that I could always play by heart. Because in the end, my parents ended up divorcing. And some kids, they say that the upside to having divorced parents is having two fridges. But luckily, I had two pianos. So when I would go to my father's house, I would always have to learn everything by heart. So the, the remainder of my childhood, I think, was quite limitless in a way. We had too much freedom, actually. And uh, I would skip class a lot. And at some point, I would only go to school to perform at the open stage or at least to practice for that. Uh, so when I came to Eindhoven, to the university here, I really had to structure myself, but sometimes I went too far in this and then I was happy to, to find this safe place again and music was there again for me at this piano. And at some point we decided to host an event there at Piano Day. So a piano has 88 keys and at the 88th day of the year, uh, it's Worldwide Piano Day. So at that day, music really is everywhere. And um, yeah, it was at this event, I think, uh, that I met one of my lovers. And at this piano, I also met another lover. So music was also there for me in love. And I wonder if you can all online feel the love tonight. I hope so. So I came to Eindhoven and um, at one point I noticed that there was not a piano at the station yet. So uh, I started a campaign for this. And it was almost a year before um, they actually put a piano there and I was the one that was allowed to open it. And this was really a, really a big victory for me and I'm, I'm so happy that it's here because it brings such a smile on people's faces and it's never felt like it was my piano. It's always felt like the piano was everyone's piano. And I think that's one of the reasons that, that why it hurt so much when this piano was destroyed. And uh, yeah, I was quite devastated when I when it really hit me. So the day after the curfew riots, it seems to be a recurring theme this evening, the curfew riots, but uh, I went there and I went to check out how wrecked the piano was. And um, so I looked at all the keys and I saw that I could still play in one key. And uh, I played in this key. And at that point, 30 people stood still there in the station's hall and 30 people who all knew what had happened before that night. And I think that must have been the best applause I've ever had. So I think all of Eindhoven is so happy that we have a new piano now. And actually 20 new pianos were offered uh, to NS. So it really is uh, a symbol that music really never dies. And um, yeah, so we hosted a live stream there to celebrate all this because we were so happy. Coming back to this church my father was a preacher man at, 
I think one of the things that made him burn out must have been that, um, yeah, he was always being good for everybody, but maybe not as good enough for himself as he could be. And this is one of the things that I want to leave behind. So the 1st of May, I will go by foot towards Spain. And what you see here are, is a map uh, which locates all public pianos. So public pianos, they are everywhere. They started actually in France. And so music will be all along my route. And the end of my route will be the very west point of Spain. And we used to think this was the westernmost point of our continent. And it's called Finisterre, which means the end of the world. And for me, that's like, wow, the end of the world. And what I'm working on now is to take you with me on this adventure of going there to the end of the world, because I actually really cannot miss my own piano there. So what I'm setting up now is a crowdfunding campaign uh, to, to take this piano to the end of the world and to take you guys on this adventure. So I really hope that you, uh, that you can join me on this. And if you're interested in this, then um, check out my social media at Daaf Music, because Music really is everywhere, even at the end of the world. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, David. Um, I certainly can feel the love. I really feel the love for music that you have. Uh, it comes, comes across really well in your presentation. Thank you for that. Um, it's a recurring theme. Um, this is this whole Corona thing. Uh, so when when this piano was destroyed at the station, how did that feel for you? What what happened? What was your first reaction? At first, it really didn't hit me yet on the Sunday. It was just too surreal, actually. So it was more like there were, there were so many crazy videos going around. And I think many people had this, that it was just too surreal to to actually be real. But the next day when I realized all the effort I had put in and that this was all gone at that moment. I was I was really, really sad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question from the audience. Which which piano is your personal favorite? I think it must be the one that's uh, standing back here next to me. I think it's uh, I've wrote almost all of my music on this uh, piano and it's always I've had this piano since I was like 12, I think. And it's always been quite light to the touch. So it's really for me, it's all also light and cheerful to play on it. All right, beautiful. Uh, thank you, David. Stick around for a bit. Um, I hope we will see you back. I hope you're going to have a wonderful journey. Um, I want to already invite you to do another presentation when you come back and talk about the 10 pianos that you come across in your journey. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, this concludes our uh, our show. I have to wrap my papers. I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I want to thank you all for being here once again. I want to thank the team, Studium Generale, especially Esther van Kalken, Tak Eindhoven, Urza Prek, David Lepper. Um, I want to thank Anneke Kotrotsos for her final contributions this time, and we hope to see you all back soon. Um, there will be a link shared uh, in the comments, in the in the chat, for TUE students who want to subscribe for their use points. So please check it out. It's going to come soon. Um, and I want you all to invite you to our next edition, which is planned on the 10th of June. I am praying that we will be able to do it live. I'm not sure that will happen, but let's keep our fingers crossed. Uh, we'll sure uh, offer you some interesting speakers, interesting stories, mesmerizing narratives so please come back to our next edition 10th of june we'll let you know where you can follow us on facebook uh, this is also a place where you can see all the speakers and connect to them so please visit our page Petja Kutja eindhoven on facebook um, that's it for me but i'm going to leave you with a little bit more of david hordijk thank you all for being here and I'll see you next time. See you at Pizza Kutja.
Dank je wel. Dank je wel voor het luisteren. En natuurlijk bedankt aan de Rotary voor deze hele mooie piano. Ik mag het eigenlijk niet zeggen, maar hij is mooier dan de vorige. Dus kom spelen als je in de buurt bent. Wat je maar kan, kom spelen. Dank je wel.